Hey, how you doing? So I'm still using just regular old simple little title cards for the start of the shoe. Um, I was hoping now that my production value has gone up a little bit besides just, you know, hey, Google Hangouts start. Um, maybe I'd spice up the intro a little. You know, nothing too whiz-bangy, but something a little nicer than... <clears throat> uh, but it turns out Camtasia's um, uh, in, you know, freebie comes with the program slides or intros. Um, they're kind of bad. I mean, you get stuff like this. Or this. Or my personal favorite. So we'll just stick with the simple little for now. Um, but um, today we're going to do some general one stuff, talk about ions and compounds that are ionic. And we'll start by talking about the two types of ions you run into. You have monatomic ions, which kind of like the name implies are ions made up of atoms, just any atom with a charge either losing or gaining electrons. And what you tend to see is that metals uh, tend to form uh, cations, positive ions, while nonmetals tend to form anions, negative ions, which you can kind of see looking at some of the examples I've given here. But molecules can also pick up and lose electrons through various types of reactions or means, and some of which we'll talk about later on in the course, and we call those polyatomic ions. And it's just a molecule that has some net charge. It can be a cation, it can be an anion, though you'll see most of the ones we run into in this course are anions, but um, not all of them. So with monatomic ions, uh, those come in two flavors. Uh, you have what we call constant charge ions, and those, like the name implies, because we don't do too much fancy stuff with names. We're a lot better than that, than biology. Biology, they got this whole Latin kind of crap going on. Us, we say, hey, it forms a constant charge. We'll call them constant charge ions. Um, but I digress. But um, you see the constant charge ions mostly in the A group of the periodic table using the AB grouping system that most folks use in Gen Chem. And the trend that you tend to see, and this is one of the reasons why we pick this grouping system out of the three that are out there, you know, um, AB and like you can see here, you number them just one through 18. But the reason we pick this grouping system where the main groups are A's, the transition elements are B's, is that you get a trend where for groups one, two, and three A, the group number or the charge is equal to whatever group number it's in. And these guys tend to form cations. So the guys in group one, your alkali metals, they tend to form plus one charges. The elements in group two, the alkaline earth metals, tend to form plus two charges. And the ones in group three A tend to form plus three charges, with the exception of boron, because it's technically a metal, non-metal. Um, we skip group four because it's kind of a weird group. Um, more on that in a sec. But for five, six, and seven A, the trend you see is that the charge equals the group number minus eight. And when you do it in that order, you get a negative number, which reminds you that these guys form anions. So group five, five minus eight is negative three. Six minus eight is negative two. And for the halogens, negative one. Now, it's not a perfect trend. Like I said, group four is kind of a mixed up group. Um, some of them follow, the metals mostly follow the first trend where those guys are typically plus four, but that's not a hard set rule. And most of the non-metals tend to be negative four. Um, and for groups five, six, and seven, uh, we do have some metals at the bottom and those tend to form cations. So. Um, but for most of the elements that you look at in Gen Chem, this trend works really well. And also, too, I, 
we don't talk about group 8a in that trend mostly um, but it kind of fits that second trend because 8 minus 8 is 0 and group 8s usually don't form ions because they're inert gases they don't react so one thing to remember about ionic compounds is that overall they're charge neutral which means you have as much positive charge from the cations as you do negative charge from the anions um, so for example sodium and chlorine they form in a one-to-one -one ratio because sodium is a plus one chlorines are negative one the net charge is zero magnesium and sulfur they also form in a one-to-one -one ratio because magnesium is plus two sulfur is negative two so the net charge is zero there but if you take sodium and sulfur and put those two together they're going to form in a two to one ratio two sodiums for every one sulfur because you need twice as many plus one ions to equal that one negative two sulfur ion and magnesium and chlorine they're going to form in a one to two ratio to give you a overall neutral compound so when you're trying to figure out how to come up with the ratios you can do it that way just kind of think about it and go okay for this many anions you need this many cations but for most of the compounds you look at most of the ionic compounds um, there's a sort of a quickie way to do it um, using this thing we call the crossover method and basically the way the crossover method works is that whatever the charge of the anion is becomes the subscript of the cation and vice versa so for example with sodium and sulfur you know notice that we have two sodiums and sulfur has a negative two charge so again the two we just kind of moves down to the other the subscript of the cation uh, the same thing happens with the charge of sodium but we usually don't write ones either in formulas or later on you'll see in reactions the one is implied Right, same thing with magnesium chloride the two goes in front of the chlorine the one sort of kind of goes in front of the magnesium or to look at a different example with you take aluminum and sulfur right, you will put the three in front of the two the two will go in front of the aluminum the three right, the three in front of the two did i just say that um back it up the uh three goes in front of the sulfur the uh, two goes in front of the aluminum, and that gives you a two to three ratio. At least I caught myself this time. I, I'm not editing the video going, oh, crap, I screwed up. How am I going to fix that? Um, I'm not even going to bother to fix it in post. But anyway, going back to aluminum sulfide, um, you, you want to check your formula. Uh, you get two aluminums and three sulfurs, their net charge will add up to zero. So that's a good way to check your work. Uh, one thing to look out for when you're using the crossover method is a case like this where you have a chromium ion with a, six, a plus six charge or a sulfur ion. Um, you do the crossover method, you're going to get two chromiums for every six sulfurs. But remember, ionic compounds, um, their formulas are empirical formulas, which means it's the simplest ratio of cation to anion. So that two to six ratio, we can actually simplify down to one to three. Right, now chromium is still plus six and sulfur is still negative two. It's just we're showing the simplest ratio. Because remember, ionic compounds don't exist as individual molecules. They're just a big, what we call a crystal lattice, a big 3D wall alternating cation and anions. And however big that wall is, the ratio is going to be three to one. And again, you check your work, uh, it still comes out to be charge neutral. So those are the constant charge ions. But there are some elements that can have more than one common charge in nature, and we call those variable charge ions. Iron, for example, is plus two in some compounds, plus three in others. Manganese can have up to five different ions uh, but it's not exclusive to the transition element section the uh, the metals on the bottom right of the main group um, those can often have more than one common charge uh, lead for example can be plus two or plus four um, 
But when you look at the transition elements, because that's where most of the um, variable charge ions come from, and you'll notice from the previous examples, they tend to be cations, you know, variable charge cations. Um, but if you look at the B groups, uh, there isn't a real clear trend between grouping and common charge. And the B groups, their labels, they mean other weird things that we usually don't talk about in general one. Um, so you really can't look at the table and figure out the charge like you can for say aluminum or sodium. Um, but um, most anions are constant charge ions and they're usually in those three groups that we talked about earlier, five, six, and seven, who have common charges of negative three, negative two, and negative one. So if you have a compound with a variable charge element, uh, you can figure out what the cation's charge is by looking at the anion and doing a little bit of algebra. So for example, in the, uh, this iron oxygen compound, FeO, you got one iron and one oxygen and remember, they have to add up to zero because they're going to be neutral overall. Well, if oxygen's going to be negative two, because it usually is, iron has to be plus two. Or if you look at uh, this titanium oxygen compound, that one titanium and those two oxygens, they have to add up to zero. And again, oxygen's going to be negative two, which means solving for your unknown which is an element instead of X, but it's still just a little bit of minor algebra. Titanium has to be plus four. Or let's say you have this compound of copper and nitrogen. Again, those three coppers and those two nitrogens have to add up to zero. Nitrogen's in group five, which means it's probably gonna be negative three, which means copper has to be plus two. Finally, we're gonna say a little bit about polyatomic ions, uh, namely how you sh write them in a formula. Because if you take an example like aluminum and nitrate, you can do the crossover method like we did earlier and come up with a ratio of one aluminum for every three nitrates. But you just can't put the three in front of the nitrate because it looks like you have one aluminum, one nitrogen, and 33 oxygens. And that doesn't look right. So what we do is we put parentheses around the polyatomic ion and we put the three on the outside. So you can clearly see you got one aluminum for every three of those nitrates. Or you take a compound of iron two and phosphate. Crossover method is gonna tell you that you have three irons for every two phosphates. And with parentheses around the phosphate, you can clearly see that three to two ratio. But you only need the parentheses if you have a ratio of two or higher. So if aluminum and phosphate come together, you don't need the parentheses around the phosphate. You just write it ALPO4. Uh, because believe it or not, you'll eventually get to the point where you can look at that and see that, you know, the cation is aluminum and the anion is phosphate. You really will, I promise. But one more example with a polyatomic cation. Uh, if ammonium and phosphate come together, that's going to give you a 3 to 1 ratio. And again, you put parentheses around the ammo ammonium, you can clearly see there are three ammoniums for every one phosphate. All right, so that's going to do it for today. See you guys next time. Insert witty comment here. There for some other weird reason that we usually don't bother going into in Gen Chem. Um, but, <coughs> um, but, 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 what am I going to say? I'm going to back it up. All right, I'll try it again. All right, let's try it again. We'll do it live. So those are the constant charge ions. And back it up. Three, two. So those are the constant charge ions. And, but there are some, blah, 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 blah. Christ. The non-metal that's gonna be with that metal, that transition metal, because Back it up. God. Fuck. Thank God for editing.
or really either be able to tell which of the two it can be at any given time. Damn it. Urgh! So those are the constant, yeah, f yeah, fuck it. So finally we're gonna say a little bit about, ugh. Finally we're gonna say a little bit about, ugh. Finally we're gonna say a little bit about polyatomic, I am, oh God. Cheers. Finally, we're going to say a little bit about polyatomic ions, mainly how you show them in a formula. Um, like ammonium and phosphate. When they come together, they're going to form three ammoniums for every one phosphate. And again, you put, God damn it. You're almost there.